We started working on Old Gods uh, probably six years ago. During this period, I had a couple of kids with my wife, and um, <laughs> so that's why it took a long time. And I'd ring up and say, oh, hey, Johnny, hey, Johnny, have you done any lyrics on, those, on, the, on the riffs and stuff? And it's like, so I'm just in the middle of folding baby clothes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I literally don't have any mental space to write lyrics yet. There's an assumption that the idea of colonialism was like making lives of people that were there already better, which is quite an assumption. The Western society, it has turned gods into material gods. Only problem is with that, there's an emptiness that you feel. And that's something I've been singing about since I was a kid. Like there's tracks on Killjoy, like Gimme Gimme, which is why do I still feel empty even though I've got everything I need? These are issues that, that indigenous cultures and First Nations people they were dealing with that just naturally. We need to be talking to people who were here before us and going, we are fucked at the moment, what can we do? You are our equals and we, we apologise. There's a climate crisis, there's rising inequality and we don't have all the answers. This was made by a dude up north in NZ and it's a piece of swamp Cody, which is like a, the hardest fucking oldest wood around. So it goes all like sort of like a stone because it's been in a swamp for fucking years. But look, it's got a musket shot from the Māori Wars. How fucking cool is that? The creative process when we write these days, somewhat different from when we began, we essentially gather together, we block off time and we block off our lives. So we turn up and we've got our phones off, we've got everything set up and we just basically jam for three hours. Through that process, we pick out sections of music that we think are really powerful. John basically will sketch lyric ideas over those musical sketches, and that's when they transform into songs. And then once we have a, you know, an amount of those songs that we, we feel are strong ideas, we bring them back in, and then we actually start developing them and taking them seriously. Adam wanted me to do all this ethereal feedback and sort of noise candy stuff just with a hundred guitar pedals in a line and throwing my guitar up against the wall and making crazy shit. And so I, I did a lot of that atmospheric stuff that comes in over the top here and there. As we've matured, it's more about what are our strengths as a band, and we make heavy music really quite well. I mean, that's the sound, that's what we... That's, that's the strongest. That's the strongest yeah, bit, yeah. We like to keep it mean. We're always conscious of the crowd bounce. We're always thinking in terms of, is this good ammunition for a live situation? Will it sound awesome through a big PA? And that's probably a lot to do with the fact that one of the earliest bands we supported was ACDC, and we went oh, we want to play through the biggest PAs possible because that just sounds so good. Yeah, this is a real distillation of all the good bits of this, of what this band does best. Communicating as musicians and as people has got better and better. I mean, we, we started pretty dysfunctional, idiot teenagers kind of vibe, you know, but we, we have actually matured, believe it or not. I think as a group of four people, we're constantly reintegrating what it is to be alive. We're reintegrating what it is to be human and examining our ideas and lens and framework for which we view the world. And so tearing that down uh, is, is a constant uh, mission. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest enemy of this band is complacency. When, especially when writing music, we rest on our laurels. We know we're really good at this and we can do this and we can finish by this time. We probably produce our worst stuff that when we're you know, comfortable when we're comfortable <laughs> you know yeah. so we need to be the ones to test ourselves i guess as well you know that's important yeah kick your own ass yes <laughs> phil so if we if we start here and then move to there and then bring it back to somewhere around here i think it'll work Boom, bam, doom, bam, doom. And to me, that that piece of music in the middle there, we've never written anything like that. And it was so sideways to what else we'd written that that just one piece of music was so fresh sounding to me. And that it's that piece of music alone that excites me the most on the record. Imagining playing that in front of a crowd, the way it feels to play drums through that song, 
was so natural and was such a good kind of division of tempo and the energy and the kind of dynamics and surprises and the movements that it makes. It's both hypnotic and dramatic. For me, I think that's going to be a signature track going on. I mean, how romantic is it that the rhythm section both love the same font song? I remember that day that Adam Spark, our producer, like called us into the control room because he was just having a little play with it after we'd recorded it. And he said, hey guys, guys, listen to this. And the chorus kicks in and we just went, oh, that sounds so big. And it's like, yay. <laughs> I just remember like feeling like a little kid. For when he started mixing, that was the first track that he mixed. Little Demons was the basis of how the album rolled out. It was the sound of like a really big engine, you know, just moving and n nothing was going to stand in its way. And then I wrote the song Feel the Fire. It all came at once. I knew I'd written something that was honest and special to me and it summed up that feeling of being trapped in Melbourne and not being able to get out of there because we were in lockdown after lockdown after lockdown and not being able to see the future like I used to be able to see the future. It all just looked like a big grey mess. Sent it to Adam Spark and his text back was to me, it was like, Oh fuck, what have you done? <laughs> uh, and, um, and he said... I think it's what we all thought. Yeah, because we, oh, we have to play it we already oh. thought We already thought we'd, we'd pretty much finish the record. I just love it. I, it was weird, I remember when we first got it, we were, me and you were like, oh my God, it's so different, it's so, it's so, I don't know man, what do you reckon? I think he's, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if he's, he got the song. And then by day two, I'd, I'd heard it five times, I went, that's my favourite song on the record. I think we sort of channeled um, a bit of Bruce Springsteen to sort of fire it up, you know? Um, <laughs> born to run, born to run, but, but played by Motorhead. <laughs> <laughs> It's the oldest song from all our writing over six years that still ended up making it onto the album. I remember playing it and my son was one years old and I was holding him yeah, and, wow. and he was like headbanging to it and I was like, okay, yeah, he's feeling it. Yeah, you went for a more sort of octopus, cartoon octopus drummy guy. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what landed. Yeah, we, yeah we, we settled on the one that we th felt would make a crowd move. Again. Yeah, no, true. Again, yes. Which was, uh, these are how many drums I have, yep. and I'm going to display them for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the band's played for these drums, <laughs> bloody use them. It's a beast of a track. It just bounces and it feels good to play, doesn't it? And also it's it's quite an up feeling. Even though yeah. it's heavy, it's yeah. like there's a up feeling rather than the uh, of it's some of the other joyous, stuff. That one. Yeah, it's there's a joyous, a joyous feeling one. to it. Yeah, yeah. I was disgusted <laughs> by what I'd read on Israel Folau's Instagram account. I don't know what he was thinking, but he said, if you're gay, you're going to go to hell. I was like, dude, that that's not a cool thing to do, you know, like you've got a lot of influence that could actually cause someone to harm themselves or, you know. I mean, it's, there's a humorous angle to it, I mean, down to the fact I call it the Hill song, you know, it's like, it's ridiculous. But at the same time, I'm pretty serious, you know, I, I ask that question in the second verse. If you're confused, maybe ask someone, you know, like, you know, rather than just going, guh. 
uh, and saying something damaging. Look, it's like they couldn't decide on if they wanted a happy bee <laughs> or a unhappy bee. So they put two mouths on the motherfucker, look. Oh, he's sad. Oh no, he's happy. <laughs> it's liberating when we finish in the studio mm. and we down tools and the album is done on it as far as we're concerned. Um, but then there, there's the other liberation of actually when people get to listen to it and get the record, mm. that there's a freedom in the fact that it is actually out in the ether now yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing we can do about it anymore. No. That it just, it's going to either, people are going to love it or hate it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few weeks back, we decided we'd start the set with Tear Down Those Names and went to, we hadn't played a show in eight months and it just went off. It has all been designed with the live stage in mind, you know, it really was. Yes, it's ear candy and, and the production I think special as, but it has been made for big PAs. Mm. Oh, and special props to Adam Spark too for... 100%. ...produced for his production and, and, and getting getting us and getting mm. where we wanted to go and, um, mm. and channeling that, you know? Mm -hmm. He was the fifth member of the band for this project. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Take some, some love for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs>